This is Robert Kraft, and I'm your host on SNN Network. And joining me today for this Wall Street View is Joe Boscovich Jr. He's a partner at Old West Investment Management. Joe, welcome great. to this Wall Street View. Thank you, Bobby. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. So uh, to start here, you know, let, let's get your background. You know, how, how did you end up to where you're currently at today? Yeah. So um, we started our our company, Old West Investment Management in uh, 2008. But I guess to um, give you a little bit of background for, for why we look at the world like we do and um, our investment process, and I, I've mentioned this before a couple of times, but um, my family uh, uh, came to this country 100 years ago, and, and we were in the, the farming and produce business. And my dad uh, started his career in that, that industry before um, shifting to the investment management business. But um, during that time, he was asked uh, by the chairman of a Southern California um, regional bank to, to serve on its board. And that bank was called Santa Clarita National Bank. And he became a board member in his late 20s and talks about how after the first several quarters on that on that board, um, every quarter uh, during the board meetings, there was always a page of the board book dedicated to stock transactions during that quarter. And it was always the chairman of the bank buying every share available. Um, so fast forward several quarters, my dad decided to put most of his savings into the stock of that bank and, and, and follow the chairman's actions. And fast forward a few years, Santa Clarita National Bank sold to First Pacific Bank, which then sold to Bank of America. And my dad made a, money, a lot of money at, a, at an early age. And the lesson learned there was that no matter, um, how, no matter how sound your analysis is, no matter how well you think you know a company, um, you probably don't know as much as the people running that business. So, you know, carry that over uh, in, into what we do today. Um, the cornerstone of our process really focuses on the people and control of our capital. And, you know, as a first principle, we only are interested in owning companies where management has more to gain or lose through their ownership than they do through their compensation. So, you know, a name could come into our focus really anyway. Um, but oftentimes we screen uh, through looking at SEC filings. So every day we go through every SEC form for filing. If a insider at a company buys or sells stock, it doesn't mean we're going to follow him into that investment. But if we see a CEO write a check buying $5 million worth of stock in his own company with his after-tax capital, um, that's interesting. So we're going to print out the proxy and dig in more and see if we can see what he does. But, you know, that's really a starting point for us. And then the first document we typically look at is the proxy statement. And I tell people that within, you know, within a half an hour of kind of digging through a proxy statement, 95 percent of companies just kind of get tossed into a trash can. Mm -hmm. And management does, either A, doesn't own enough stock or, or if they do own enough stock, their compensation doesn't make sense to us. It's not tied to metrics that are shareholder friendly. So, so I guess, you know, really, um, you know, to boil it down, we just want to be invested with management teams um, that are aligned with shareholders. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that kind of really captures a huge essence of our, of our process. And then, you know, after that, we're, we're value investors. We don't want to overpay for companies. Um, but I also, you know, have learned the hard way that cheap stocks are usually cheap for a reason. And, and that's because they're not good businesses. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, tr try to look for companies that we think are cheap, but but still have the ability to, you know, to grow and, and, and often try to identify, you know, catalysts that will unlock that value. But but once again, only in the context of a company that is that is led by an owner manager. Got it. So let me ask you this because you know a lot's been made about <clears throat> share buybacks in recent years and companies going in buying back stock. You know, we all know that there's a game sometimes that's played by some oh. of these by, by some of these management teams and yeah. and and not even just specifically to share buybacks, but you know, you'll see that, you know, 
you go on the, especially if they're more of a, a be careful here, but a marketing type company, you know, tends yeah. to put out a lot more news than usual. And they put out news that the CEO just bought back uh, or, or just bought some shares on the open market. You know, yeah. I mean, how do you tell from the, the real management team that's like, oh no, I, we're actually, we love this business and we're going in and buying more because we believe in the business versus the kind of smoke and mirrors of like, oh look, they're going in and buying, back, buying some shares on the open market, but maybe they've had some major success in the past and they have just a huge cash pile there and, yeah. and it's and, and there's nothing for them to go in and buy some more shares on the open market. Yeah, well, I, I think first off, you know, dif differentiate between um, SEC Form 4 buying and corporate buybacks, right? Right. Um, but I would say the easiest way, uh, you know, outside of valuation and trying to figure out what a company is worth and are they buying back stock at a, you know, discount to, to intrinsic value or, or, or are they, you know, paying a stupid price? Um, outside of that, I think the, the easiest way to, you know, is this a good capital allocation decision at this point in time? buying stock well let's see what the uh how much stock the ceo owns because mm. that, that that'll tell you pretty quick i mean there's a lot of companies where you see companies buying back a lot of stock the ceo doesn't own a lot of stock in this company so i can guarantee you that that ceo that's the guy that'll that, that'll buy back stock at a stupid price mm. you know versus you know the ceo that owns 10 percent of a company um, that capital allocate that capital allocation decision on a stock buyback. There's no one that that affects more so than him. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, I, I think when you look at the the total ownership of a, of an executive at a company, um, that uh, tells you if if you know he's making capital allocation decisions that are shareholder friendly or not. Are they a shareholder themselves? And in most cases, the answer is no. And I could tell. I mean. There are so many examples, especially in our in our um, long short fund where we've been short companies, and it's almost laughable where, um, you know, the company's buying back ten percent of their stock, and the CEO is selling fifty percent of his stake at the company at the same time that he's buying stock. I mean, that should be criminal. That should be criminal. That a CEO is taking shareholder money to buy back his own stock while he's bailing out of his own, and that and it happens all the time. So I so I would say you know. What actions are a CEO is a CEO taking with his own money, and 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 that greatly informs, um, you know what what I think an investor, uh, you know, should decide, you know, in terms of is he making good capital allocation decisions for that business or not? Gotcha. Well, you know, look, I I, I want to I know we dug right into some theory here, and I, I feel yeah. like we could go all day on this, but. I also want to want to direct a lot of people because you just did a great interview on this with with Tobias Carlisle on the uh, the acquirers multiples. So I, I watched it and I, I thought it was really good. So Thank definitely you. recommend a lot of people go and check that out. Um, you know, I do have to also ask though, going back to your background. I mean, you mm -hmm. said you know your your father got into the investment management business uh, at a young age. Um, I'm sure that had a lot of influence on you. I had a very similar experience. My father was an investment banker for many years. That had big influence on me. So how did that invest? How did that really shape your your investing, your own personal investing philosophy? You know, even before you came over and and joined uh, Old West. Yeah, well, it's funny. You know, I would say the the one amazing thing about this business, and you know, we've been running an intern program the last couple of years, and we recruit straight out of um, the U.S. University of Southern California, uh, they have a value investment club. And these, you know, these kids come and interview for internships and they're freshmen in, in college and they've already, you know, read everything ever put out there, um, you know, about any of the great business leaders and investors and, and, and kind of the passion and knowledge that a lot of people have at a young age is just incredible. And that wasn't, that wasn't me. You know, my dad, kind of, even though he was always an active investor growing up, um, when I graduated from college, he kind of did a midlife career change in the investment management business. So, you know, although I learned a lot about business, um, growing up for, from him, um, I had a, uh, you know, great opportunity at a young age. Um, when I, when I, I went to the university of Southern, Southern California, I studied business and finance and, um, I also played football. 
mm-hmm. uh, for the Trojans. And, you know, USC has a great alumni network, but they, they have a very proud uh, football heritage. So, you know, as an athlete, um, you're often not all the athletes uh, uh, take advantage of the opportunity. But as an athlete, um, and particularly as a football player, I, you have a lot of great access to internships during school. So there was a, um, a rabid USC football fan that was was one of the bigger um, producers at the time at Bear Stearns in the country. And he worked in the Los Angeles office. So I was working out in the weight room and our director of football operations came up to me and said, um, Hey Joe, would you have any interest in, in interviewing for an internship at Bear Stearns? And, you know, I was a sophomore at the time. And unlike all these interns that we hire now that, you know, are all these great value investors at a young age, I hadn't even heard of Bear Stearns at the time. Right. Um, but I said, (laughs) sure. So I went and interviewed and, um, you know, there were two individuals at Bear Stearns that that were great mentors to me and, and taught me a lot. And I'm still really close with with one of them. And uh, so that was kind of a great introduction for me into the investment business. And then fast forward from there, um, that's really kind of after that where I, I learned a lot from my dad and his partners and the, the, the money management startup business that he that he kind of midlife career changed to and his partners. But you know, then I always tell people that this is a business too, where if you have an interest, um, I mean, there's so many great resources and books and mm-hmm. things to watch. And I mean, I mean, you could literally get your MBA, PhD, all of that, just reading the bookshelves of the greats. And like I said, the great business operators, the great investors. So there's not a shortage of things out there if you're passionate about it. No, it so. Not. You know, so so I would say that that, that really I, I just kind of uh, immersed myself in a lot of those those works, and and um, it just you know grew on me from there, and and uh, you know trying to build a great business. We've been in business for um, ten years now. Our first five years were were excellent years for us, um, great performance, and then these last five years, I tell people it's been kind of exhausting. It's like you know, running on a treadmill. And, um, you know, this has just been, an you get a workout where, in, right? You get a workout in, you get a workout in, yeah. <laughs> but, this just, but this has been an environment where you just kind of blindly, you know, buy the thing stocks and you make all the money you want. But, um, I have to believe that, um, people that actually do work and stay up late reading 10 K's and digging in the financials and, um, thoughtful stock picking has got to matter at some point again. Sure. And, um, I believe it will. And, uh, you know, just excited about the future, but it's, I know a lot of your listeners, I'm sure are, are avid readers of, of Howard Marks, um, quarterly letters, but one of my, my favorite letters that all, he wrote all quarterly letters. Yeah, but one of one of one of my yeah all quarter letters. But one one of my favorite Howard Marks letters, and your re, your re, listeners will will probably remember. And sorry, I keep on putting this up, but it's like my camera's slipping. Um, but one of my favorite quarterly letters, I think, was back in like in two thousand three, when he wrote about uh, his time on the investment committee. I think it was at at the University of Pennsylvania. And if I'm recalling the aspects of the letter right, he talked about how, you know, in 97, 98, 99, the the investment staff was catching a lot of flack as, you know, they return. And I don't remember the returns, but they were returning, let's say, like 13 percent per year. But the market was re- returning 20 percent per year. So everybody was disgruntled and wanted to make changes to the investment staff. And then you know, fast forward in 2001, 2002, 2003, they returned like 2% per year and the market was down 10% per year or whatever it was. And uh, his point was, if you kind of looked at that period through a bird's eye view, you'd sit there and say, this is this is crazy. But people are mad when I'm returning 12% per year, but they're happy when I'm returning 2% per year. And it's just this, this world you live in where Um, We live in this relative world, right? It's like, how, how, how nice is my house compared to my neighbor's house? How nice is my car compared to my neighbor's car? And when you get too caught up into that, that, that relative performance, um, 
it's almost like relative performance is the recipe for relative relative performance measures. It's like the ultimate recipe to long-term underperformance. And so, you know, we, we try to think for ourselves and pick individual stocks on our own. I was going to say, you're, you're, I think we're, we have a, a, an A plus tweet right there. What, what was it again? Relative performance. <laughs> I don't know. Rel- relative relative per- perform- performance measurements is a recipe for long-term underperformance. All right, audience, I challenge you, please, someone tweet that out. That's too good. And make sure you give <laughs> I, Joe credit. Quote me. And I actually, I don't think I'm, I don't think I was uh, quoting someone that said that before. So maybe I just coined my first quote. How's that? That'd be too funny if your dad just called you out. Like, dude, I told you this when you were like 10. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, you know, I have to ask, what, what would you say in your experience? You know, you said during your first five years at, I'm guessing the first five years at Old West, right? You were mm-hmm. talking. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So my first five years at Old I, I spent, um, after college, I, I, I joined the, the money management firm that my dad had joined in its infancy. He had joined that company as a partner and, I joined that company and you learned a lot from my dad, learned a lot from my dad's partners that, you know, started that business. So, so, so that was, that was a great further immersion uh, of, for me into the investment management world. And that was really more, more so into the stock picking world right. and value investing world. My experience at Bear Stearns was more kind of like, you know, broad based stock sure. market, but yeah. What, what would you say in that, in those beginning years, was the point where where everything kind of clicked for you, where you kind of were like, all right, I hit my groove of this is this is kind of more or less my philosophy that I want to use going forward, and I just want to kind of you know tinker with it a little bit here and there, but this is where you know really focused on management, looking at form fours. You know, what was it that you saw? You're like, all right, this is my path. Well, you know, it's funny that you asked that. No one's ever asked me that, but um, you know, early on um, in my career when I started in the investment management business, I was kind of really more on the the business development marketing side. And, um, you know, over a course of years, I, I worked with several people on the investment side. And as as some of those people, you know, came and went, um, I sat there and as I studied it more and I, 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 I can do this, you know, I can do this. And so it was just kind of a, you know, a progression of, um, know gradually learning from others and and you know now i've i'm not the cio of, of our company my dad is and i have several great partners on the investment side my, my partner brian lax is a big part of our investment team but you know i i've been on the investment side and part of the investment team um you know for a while now so uh so I, yeah I, i'd say it's just kind of gradually clicked over time Graduate. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, hundred percent. I, I mean, I'm saying because I feel like we had very similar, you know, entrance in it, you know, we kind of right out of school, both went to work with our dads and it's kind of financial services industry. And, you know, I, I felt like for me, there was times where, you know, I was kind of just, you know, going with the flow, not really knowing what's going on. But then, you know, as time went on, it all started to click for me as to, you know, what I saw was successful, you know, how I, looked at companies, you know, as, uh, especially doing interviews with companies, you know, you learn yeah. pretty quickly, which ones are, all right, this guy sounds like more, I hear more of this and I follow up with them. They tend to be more snake oil salesmen <laughs> yeah. <laughs> versus yeah. the guys that, that you're like, Oh, th- this sounds like a legit company. Sounds like, you know, good captain, good person kind of running the ship there. Yeah. Well, and you also kind of learn a lot about yourself, um, you know, uh, throughout the way. And I, you know, I've always thought of myself as, as a, as a very extroverted person. And I think you know, as time goes on, I, I've realized maybe I'm not as extroverted as, as, as I thought I was. And this is interview and, number two for yeah, you. I mean, come on. Yeah. No, no, maybe I'm not as extroverted <laughs> as I thought I was. And maybe I actually, you know, prefer to kind of, you know, read newsletters and dig into companies and, 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 um, yeah, so I, I, I've, I've really enjoyed that aspect of the company and I know that you're, you know, focused on the small and micro cap space and, and, you know, we're not focused on the small and micro cap space. We kind of own companies across the, the capital structure. But when I look at the companies that I am kind of responsible for, it's funny how most of the companies I'm responsible for are 
micro cap and small cap companies. And that's kind of what I've gotten in the portfolio. And I think that, you know, I, I, we all have our strengths and weaknesses and I've, I've learned that, you know, I've, you could have an analytical edge, you could have an informational edge. And, and I, I, I think to, you know, to beat, um, other people in the performance game, owning a bunch of large cap companies, I, I kind of think you need to have that analytical edge, right? And why are you analytically better than the guy at Goldman who's covering this company? And I just don't know that that's where I can excel. But, you know, on the small and micro cap side, I, I mean, I really enjoy learning about different businesses and industries. And I mean, I, I love meeting with management teams and, and um, kind of really asking uh, you know, difficult questions that are maybe more qualitative than quantitative. And, and I think when you invest in small, smaller companies, um, kind of that fundamental aspect of investing is, is pretty critical. Oh yeah. I mean, that's, the, you know, bottoms up. I, th this, yeah. I mean, this is the fun part of the markets. I think my audience and I think anybody who's listening to this, who is invested in micro caps, I don't want to qualify and say the ones that have made money. I think the ones who also may who may have lost money. I think we can all agree this is the fun part of the markets. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, but we digress. I want to uh, actually one of the main reasons I invited you on is that you just published your your Q3 2019 letter to investors. You know, and I wanted to get your take on thus far on the market and you know where what direction it's heading. You know, you mentioned a little bit about it in the letter and actually in this interview a little bit earlier where you kind of can throw a dart fang stocks and, you know, you're doing all right. Um, and for full disclosure, I do not own any of the fang stocks. And I'm going to ask you in a second too, Joe. But uh, right after you give that answer, you know, I'd love to get your take on what's been going on so far. Yeah, uh, we don't own any of the fang stocks. And I guess if I could rewind the clock, I, I, I would have bought all the thing stocks <laughs> five years ago and, and sold them right now. Um, <laughs> you know, th this has been a, this has been a really tough period, you know, and I think that, um, you know, we think in our fund, thank God we're not big short sellers. Um, cause then we would, would be completely waxed over the last, you know, five years. But uh, we do have some short exposure. And I think with a lot of our shorts, we've been right on. Um, the problem is, and, and what I would have never known and never predicted, and I don't know anybody that really did predict it, but um, who would have ever thought that we would have QE1 followed by QE2, followed by QE3, and now QE4, even though they're not calling it QE. But um, you've had all this money printing. You have uh, record low interest rates, $17 trillion in negative yielding rates of, around the world. And, and so really you have this big you know, quantitative easing um, experiment, and, and now we're going to have you know, maybe monetary – modern monetary theory and, and more money printing, but it's, it's, um, that's what's kept the market going. And, um, I don't know that it, it, it'll stop. And, um, you know, so you've had all these companies out here and they've been able to borrow records amount of money and they've been able to, um, buy back stock with borrowed money and company corporate debts at an all time high. And um, companies have had access to cheap capital. All I mean, you look at all these, you know, the unicorns and IPOs, and 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 it's just I don't know that any of these companies would have been able to kind of find their way over, you know, th through this last five years um, without these the, these easy money policies, and um, I. You know, it's almost like I heard the, someone say this the other day, but it's almost like you've had this this huge, uh, uh, you know, party and there's this big bar tab, but the bar tab has yet to be paid. Right. And um, so, you know, I, I, I think who, who knows where the market goes? I, I think as like I said, as 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 interest rates are at record lows, that pushes people into riskier assets. And um, 
I guess if it continues, you know, the stock market and real estate and things like that, that's the, um, where else do you put your money? I just think that's a very dangerous way, dangerous way to invest. And, you know, the thing about risk is risk is not quantifiable until everything blows up. Um, so, you know, we, we are, uh, risk averse and, and just not willing to, to, to buy into some of these assets at what we think are crazy prices and it's hurt us on a relative basis. But I do believe if we, you know, keep our head down and, um, continue to try to identify great companies on a bottom up basis, um, we will be rewarded. And who knows? I mean, I mean, I mean, it looks like the market's starting to kind of, um, recognize, uh, the the limitations of of quantitative easing i mean if you look at what's happened with the you know the ipo market for example you know with uber and WeWork and and you know peloton and beyond meats had a you know a rough couple of months and i think that um the investment investing public maybe seems to be getting a little bit um leery and and so so we'll see. I, I you know I, I we're not in the business of we're not economists. And like we said in our letter, you know I think it was a Warren Buffett quote where he said, "If anybody tells you which way the market's going, run the other direction because nobody knows." Mm-hmm. So all all we really can do is is look for um you know look for great companies, try to buy into those companies at at attractive prices. Real quick, are you a shareholder in? I think you said. In any of the last companies that you just said, I think it was Peloton, Beyond Me, and Uber. No, we're not. And Google, maybe I think. We're not. Okay. We're not. We're not. Well, so I want to follow up on this because I, that- I, I will say, you know, maybe what's different. Why this is a, a tough period is when you you talk about the Fang stocks. I mean, Facebook, Apple, Google, Amazon. I mean, those are all great companies. You know, so I, I think people that you know, compare this period to the late nineties. It's, it's like, you know, you had a bunch of kind of zombie companies and, and, and these companies are just, you know, like I said, they're great companies. I do think, and you've heard some smart people, you know, talking about the, the, this kind of index ph- phenomenon. And I, you know, like Michael Burry recently came out and said the, you know, the whole ETF market's the next bubble. And, um, you know, I don't, know about that. And like I said, these are good companies, but there is something concerning about trillions of dollars flowing into passive ETFs. And, you know, these ETFs, they're not equal weighted, they're cap weighted, right? So when you put $100 in the S&P 500, um, something like 25 of that dollars is going to the top 10 names or whatever. So the biggest company, which is Apple, and that's a 4% weighting that just gets pushed higher as money goes into that passive fund. And you've had trillions of dollars flowing into those funds. And so, you know, we've gone from the day where people are maybe buying Apple stock because they go, this is a good company. And instead, you have people buying Apple stock, not even knowing that they're buying Apple stock. Mm-hmm. And um, I would say that that money flow, it works the same way coming out as it does going in. You know, when people sit there and say, I don't want to own stocks anymore. And if you have some sort of event where people just press the sell button, they're no longer saying, I want to sell my Apple because I don't like that company. They're saying, I'm selling my Apple. I don't even know I own Apple in the first place. And so I think money goes out the same way it comes in. So, you know, we'll see. I, I Like I said, I, I don't think that we're in the business of predicting what's going to happen. But, you know, if that theory is true, um, I mean, potentially there's a day where these FANG stocks become great value stocks. I was just going to say, I mean, because uh, I was thinking, yeah. I was just thinking about it myself. I'm like, no, you're right. Because somebody, if if they're just selling because they're, you know, maybe they're scared or, you know, they just see the markets are in turmoil or whatever. And, you know, they're just trying to sell their, you know, the ETF that they have their money invested in. Yeah. They don't know that they own Apple. They don't know that they right. own Facebook or Google or anything like that. They're just like, unless, I mean, unless they're, they, they're actively trying to watch it and see what they're actually owning. They're going to be selling things that they didn't even know that they owned, you know? And, yeah. and what's interesting, cause even before we, we started recording, we were talking about how, you know, some of these companies are still, like you said, even just now is that they're great companies and they're some of these valuations, still they still might be undervalued we don't know 
You know, I'll tell you the, the one interesting thing about a period like this, and I've been thinking about it recently after listening to a, a, a couple of people speak that that I admire. You know, but, but, but this this one individual was saying that you know maybe if you think about it, times like these where you have really cheap money, easy access to capital, times like these, maybe they're needed to like spawn the next great ideas. Because if you think about it, the Amazons of the world. Um, the Netflixes of the world, they were kind of spawned during the, the the manic days of the late 90s. If it weren't for the late 90s, maybe an Amazon wouldn't even be in existence today. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, so, you know, thinking that, you know, maybe what we could do and I wasn't I wasn't in business myself in the late 90s, even though I did pay attention to the market. Um if that's the case and the Amazons of the world were spawned in the late 90s, well, what's what's kind of being spawned right now? What what next Amazon? And, you know, so I think, you know, try to identify um, kind of the next compounders and get it right this next time. Well, around. should we start a blockchain technology company then? <laughs> I mean, what do you think? Like that? There you there, go. There it is. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, uh, my next question, this has to do with another point that you made in the um, in your letter, is that we're about a year away from the 2020 election. And in the letter, you discussed the potential impacts of this election cycle on the economy. So, you know, it's interesting with what you were just saying, how, you know, we're, we're in this strange time where, you know, interest, interest rates continue to go down and you get a lot of pressure from the administration for interest rates to go down. And you can kind of see the effect it might be having on the stock market where, you know, there's just so much more access to capital and just a lot more money out there. Really. Yeah. Why? Well, I, well, I just think, if, you know, if you're an investor, where, where are you going to put your money today? Yeah. Um, you know, you could put it in bonds paying zero or you, you know, you could put it in the stock market. And, and so I, I do think that th- these easy money periods and low interest rates, I mean, for sure, it's pushing money into riskier assets and and um, we'll see what happens. All right. Well, well, let's let's. What was the main message then from from the letter itself in terms of the the potential impacts that this election cycle could have on the economy? Oh, I just think it's 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 right. This is just you have two. It's almost like two extreme opposites, and um, you know, Trump's Trump's been great for the market in terms of um, you know deregulations and corporate profits and. Yet, but yet you have huge income inequality, and you know if you know Elizabeth Warren or another Democratic nominee, um, you know, gets office, they are going to do a, do a, do away with um, you know a lot of those deregulations, and and it's um, I it's just I, I it's probably a, a horrible thing to invest today speculating on who wins who wins the election because I think the um, either outcome, um, the, the, the possibilities are just so different. So, so once again, you know, bottom up work focused on great companies led specifically led by great management teams. Gotcha. So So, you also discussed in the letter, um, mm -hmm. that there's this age old debate, you know, uh, and I quoting you here, you know, which asset class has created more wealth for individual investors, stocks or real estate and quote, you know, um, and I feel like you're, you were using this to, as a, kind of set up. And, and then also you had an ex, uh, a company in there that was an example of this, you know, so what was your main point in, in really talking about this kind of this, I guess, cross section of the two, you know, is it because you're looking at this company in particular or, you know, this just this space itself, like REITs in particular is interesting right now? Well, no, I, 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 I once again, it's just all about it's company specific, but, um, you know, I think in, New York, people that are in this business in New York, which is most of the investment business, um, it's a uh, Wall Street. I mean, yeah, you you go to the the gym or the club, and everybody there works for one of the big Wall Street companies. Well, as you know, you're out here in Southern California. It's like everybody's real estate. You know, the gym I go to, it's I think I'm the the one person in the investment management business, and 99 percent, you know, they're commercial real estate brokers, residential real estate brokers. That's just what it what it is, and. You know, Los Angeles. So, you know, being in Southern California, um, yeah, I, I, you know, most most wealthy people in Southern California have made their money in real estate. And, and um, you know, I think people, 
you know, you, you, you like what you're, what you're good at and, and where you've made your money. And, you know, I've always told people, so, I mean, so that's part of why we make that comparison in the letter, but I, you know, have always said, you know, tell Donald Trump, the stock market's a better investment and probably laugh at you and tell Warren Buffett real estate's a better investment. And he'd probably laugh at you. Um, but they're both great. And, and, you know, in the letter we said, if you look at the three richest people in the world, right, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, they all made their money in the stock market. So we weren't really saying real estate versus stocks, but, you know, in this case, we talk about Kennedy Wilson. Um, this is a real estate company and, uh, you could buy the stock at what we think is a, is a great value and you're aligned and one of the best capital allocators and managers and, and the guy by the name of Bill McMorrow and, you know, Bill McMorrow, he's been the CEO at Kennedy Wilson for 30 years. He's done a fantastic job growing the business. Um, adjusted net income has grown, I think 47% annually. Um, uh, the dividend has grown, I think 27% annually right now you could buy into this company at a, you know, at, at 12 times earnings, a big discount to book value pays a 4% dividend yield and he's buying back stock. Once again, we talked earlier in the interview about, you know, companies, you have a lot of companies buy back stock, but they buy back stock at stupid prices. So how do we know that, um, you know, Bill McMorrow is making that capital allocation decision to buy back stock at an attractive price? Well, I would say, like I said, if you look at financial metrics, you know, 12 times earnings, big discount to book value. Um, he's buying back that stock at, at, at what we think are attractive valuations, but he owns 10% of the company. Mm -hmm. He owns, he owns 10% of the company. Um, so just his dividend is over $13 million a year. So, I mean, there is no shareholder in the company that is more affected by that stock buyback than him. Mm -hmm. Um, so he owns 10% of the company. Um, and then what's interesting is if you monitor the insider transactions, which we do with all of our companies, um, every time, if you, if you look at the last several years, every time he has a stock grant that vests, well, he'll surrender just enough stock to pay the, um, the, the cost of the tax, but he keeps the rest of the stock. And if you look through very seldom, have you ever seen Bill McMorrow sell any stock in his company and Actually, he has opportunistically bought stock on the open market when it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he, he's, he's your ideal owner manager. Um, you know, this is a great company. I, I'll, I'll read this to you, but I mean, I mean, when you talk about someone building a great company, he, um, he, uh, I gotta find this. Okay. Yeah, he took over as CEO at Kennedy Wilson in 1988 when the company had a million dollars in revenue. I mean, today the company does $713 million in adjusted EBITDA and $400 million in adjusted net income. He's done a fantastic job running the company. He's a great owner manager. Like I said, owns 10% of the company. He cares about that stock price and that dividend payment more than anyone else because he is the third largest shareholder in the company. Um, yeah, and it just as a kind of a fun side note, Fairfax Financial, which most value investors know, but is run by Prem Watsa, call him the... Um, what right it's the uh oracle of ontario i think right the warren buffett of canada well anyways uh fairfax owns eight percent of kennedy wilson so i know that you know they agree in in the quality of the company and the quality of management and um so just you know it fits our process cool so i gotta oh, oh real quick and i'm yep. uh, this goes without saying i'm sure but i have to ask are you a shareholder in Kennedy Wilson? Yes. Okay. Yes, we are. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so, sorry, it's a funny joke. Uh, so, I just did a, a, a live podcast in Austin, and uh, uh, one of one of my panelists, Chris Lahiji, he he made a funny joke. He oh, goes, I know Chris. Yeah, no, he yeah. he made he made a really funny joke. He goes, "Listen, man, the next time I'm on one of these things, I know you're obligated to ask that question." I'm going to literally name off every single company on the S&P 500. So you're going to have to ask me every single time if I that's own pretty, <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty funny. You know, Chris, is, Chris is great. And I don't know if you've ever been to any of the LD micro conferences, oh, but he, yeah, but he does a, he, he does a great job and he's a, he's a hard worker. I um, like Chris a lot. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm sure I'll see you in December. You got it, man. So one, one, another question I do have is, uh, 
you know, what, what, what would you say are some of the things that you're looking for uh, for your clients as potential events uh, or opportunities for the rest of 2019 going into 2020? Um, well, you, you, like I said, you, you know, we're very concentrated, um, you know, six, 50, 60% of our capital is probably on our top 10 ideas. Um, I would say this is kind of maybe off the topic, but we have a big kind of sector focus right now in, in, in the, uh, uranium industry. Which, oh. um, I think let's I, dig I, in. Let's go. Let's uranium. Yeah. All right. Well, so you know what is uranium? Uranium is the feedstock that goes into nuclear power plants, and you know it's funny. We're in California. You talk to people in California. People in California, they kind of go they, nuclear power, and they you know kind of shun like that's that's dying in this country. Well, you know we in the United States consume you know, more, more nuclear power than anyone else uh, in the world. And it's, it's a vital part of our electric grid. I want to say, I think it's 20% of our electric grid is, is fueled by nuclear power. And it is the only um, source of carbon free electricity that is, isn't intermittent. So what I mean by that is you have, you know, solar and you have wind but solar doesn't work when it's not sunny and wind doesn't work when it's not windy. And, um, the funny thing about solar and wind is because it doesn't work when it's not windy or, or, or sunny, um, both are backed up by, you know, dirty natural gas or coal, coal, uh, fired power plants. And that doesn't even meant, uh, bring in the fact the the ecological effects. And, um, I don't, have the number on the top of my head, but it's something like, like the average solar farm, uh, you need 400 times the amount of real estate that you do for, you know, or to produce the same amount of electricity that a, that a nuclear power plant would produce. You need something like 450 times the amount of real estate for a solar farm. And then, and then what about, you know, the, these, these, the solar farms, they, they have a pretty short lifespan. So what happens, um, after that lifespan, when these all need to be, you know, recycled and, and then you, with wind farms, it's like the, if you look at the, the, the endangered bird species, it's, it's kind of like a, a wind farm. It's like a bald eagle, um, cemetery. Um, so nuclear power, I, I, and, and then you have this growing, you have this, uh, this growing drumbeat for nuclear power. So, or, or for, um, Clean right? energy, oh, clean energy. Clean energy so, you know, you want clean energy. Nuclear power is, is, is a must. It's critical. Um, so with the situation, um, now for the investment opportunity, um, in 2011, you had the Fukushima earthquake. Um, at the time, uranium prices were about $70 per pound. Well, when you had the Fukushima earthquake in 2011, it damaged one of the nuclear reactors off the coast of Japan. And um, as a result, as a precaution, Japan took their entire nuclear fleet offline overnight. And that reduced roughly 20% of world demand. And, and, and so you're awash in supply. The price of uranium went from um, 70 bucks to 18 bucks over a pretty short period of time. And we've had this, uh, you know, period ever since where you, you, you've had oversupply. So a few things have happened in the last 18 months where the two largest, um, the uranium space, it, it was $150 billion space 10 years ago. Today it's a $7 billion space. Wow. Um, so that an 80% of that market cap. So I said it's about 7 billion today, 10 billion today, 70%, 80% of that market cap is to two producers, uh, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan's uh, state run Kazataprom, which actually just went uh, public with 80 uh, quasi public recently. And then uh, Canadian based Cameco corporation. Um, both of those entities, uh, uh, Kazakhstan in the last 18 months, they took 20% of their supply offline to bring the market into balance. 
and Cameco uh, took their largest mine uh, or put it in the care and maintenance MacArthur MacArthur River, um, and that reduced uh, that that reduced production significantly. So you've had about twenty percent of of total production taken offline, and that's really to a large extent that has 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 dried up that excess inventory. And so what Cameco basically came forward and they said, look, rather than produce and um, when we're a wash in supply or produce new primary supply and sell it at a price where we're not making a lot of money, we're just going to buy up that excess inventory, deliver that into our long term contracts. And um, so basically what they've said is, look, we're not going to we're not going to bring any new primary production online until the spot price crosses through 40, 50 bucks. And so what happened, you know, so right now you have spot at the, the spot price is at 25. So there's two prices to look at in the uranium industry. There's the spot price, which is a very shallow price. Um, there's very little transaction done there. Um, think of, th- think of the spot price. It, it's kind of more, more the daily price and it could be, it's a very liquid, um, it's a very liquid price. Well, the long-term contracting price, that's the price where utilities contract with the miners. And if you look at, you know, since I think 2000, 90% of 90% of, of the um, supply that the miners or the utilities have bought from the miners are done at the long-term contracting price. So Cameco has been buying off the spot market to deliver into their long-term contracts. And just to show you how shallow that, that, that market is, earlier this year, Cameco announced they, they had to buy a million pounds off the spot market to deliver into their long-term contracts. And the price of, um, of, of uranium was kind of pushed from like 18 bucks to 25 bucks. So you could see how shallow that is. Mm-hmm. And they said, look, we're not going to produce new supply until, the, until spot passes through 40. We're not going to we're not going to enter into any new long-term contracts until we see the spot price, um, you know, at 40 bucks. And, and so that's going to happen. And as it happens, a lot of these companies, especially if you look at some of the companies further down the tail, some of the explorers, some of the develop, um, developers, I mean, these companies are basically, you know, you, you have a company where let's say their project isn't economical until the, the unless the price is at 50 bucks, well, here at 18, um, the market cap of that company, it's almost trading as an option mm-hmm. where if the price gets to 50, now the MPV of that, of, of that company is, you know, six, seven, eight X from where it is now. So there's a, you know, few, so you ask me about, and this has been a very long answer. I'm sorry, but you ask me about the next two months for the remainder of the year. One thing that will be uh, kind of exciting and we'll see are a couple of the U S producers, uh, mainly a company um, called Energy Fuels, U U U U. They are the only uh, domestic producer of uranium, or the largest domestic producer of uranium. And um, part of the reason you haven't seen any long-term contracting in the uranium space in the last, um, you know, several years uh, was because about two years ago. The two U.S. producers, Energy Fuels and Your Energy, they petitioned Section 232 with the Department of Commerce. To be, and they basically asked the Department of Commerce to, to, to look into the role that uranium imports play in our country's national security. Um, if you go back you know, years ago, the U.S. produced uh, the majority of the, the uranium that we consumed. Well, today, 98% of our uranium needs are, are imported, and about half, half of that's imported from the sphere of Russia. So we are completely today dependent on cheaper uh, foreign imports, largely from, from Russia. And um, so the U.S. producers, they asked for a 25% quota. Um, where the utilities would have to buy 20, 25% of the uranium needs from the U.S. producers. And Trump basically came out, and this is three months ago, and said, I'm not going to do that, um, but I do want to support the entire entire nuclear fuel cycle here in the United States. And really, if you, if you kind of read between the lines, I think what um, Trump said is, 
I want to help you guys, just not at the expense of the utilities, which makes a lot of sense, right? The utility lobby strong and, you know, the utilities obviously don't want to, you know, pay 50 bucks for, uh, to a, to a U.S. producer when they could buy it cheaper from Kazakhstan. Right. So, um, so he rejected 232, but he formed a 90 day working group to figure out a way that they could, our country, the government could, could further support the nuclear, the nuclear fuel cycle in the United States. So 90 days passed and then they came out and they said, you know, we're still looking into it. We'll, you know, we're, we're going to do something to support the industry, but we're going to delay it 30 days. So we'll see, you know, that, that 30 day delay that would put us, you know, the next week or two. Um, but I would expect the administration to come out and they to, to take, take some action to support companies like, like energy fuel. So that could be maybe some sort of, um, you know, subsidy, um, it was rumored earlier that, that, that the, the U S government was looking at maybe stockpiling uranium. So, you know, you'd have like, like you have the strategic oil reserve where well, you would stockpile uranium. Um, but, but clearly that would be a huge boon to the U S producers, mainly a company like energy fuels. So, so energy fuels is a pretty large position for us right now. And, um, although, you know, we don't invest with such a short term time horizon, that is a position in our portfolio it will greatly, greatly boost performance just in the near term here. Got it. All right. Well, so, Jim, oh, sorry. Yeah, so, so sorry that that was, that was like really, really long. <laughs> you probably, you probably weren't, uh, expecting to talk about uranium so much, but, but there you go. I mean, quite frankly, it's something that, you know, it's a topic that I, you know, mo uh, really on the value, I, I speak to a lot of value investors here and, and, and growth too, but even on both sides, we don't really talk too much, um, uh, on the, on mining or basic materials. You know, I, I speak to more, a lot of economic geologists when it comes to the mining focus or, or, or uh, those mining investments that they're looking at. So, you know, it's interesting to hear that this perspective and how there is some, some interesting ideas out there. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, real quick, I have to ask: yeah. Is uh, are you a shareholder in the <laughs> in either Cameco, uh, Kaz the new Kazakhstan ADR? I think it's ADR, right? Uh, and then uh, Energy Fuels or Your Energy? We well, own them. Uh, we, we own them all. I, we don't own them all, own them all in our in our core funds, but we actually. We think it's such a phenomenal opportunity today. We actually launched a uranium-focused fund uh, about a year ago, and my partner Brian Lax is the is the PM on that fund, and um, really a kind of our our our, our, author, our authority in uranium. So, gotcha. He he owns it in that fund. Gotcha. All right, Joe. We're at that point. Where can my audience go and find more information about you and Old West Investment Management? Yeah, our website, oldwestim.com. And then I have a a Twitter a Twitter feed and I I think it's at uh, Boscovic B O S K O V I C six four. Okay. Are we sure? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> well Joe, thanks so much for joining me today, man. I really do appreciate it. You got it, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you.